Hello all, today's chats with my guests will be covering a couple of topics that can affect us all at any age, but as we get older, seem to take on more prominence in our lives, pets and work or the lack of it. As we are a growing ageing population, living longer, working longer and keeping more pets inside our homes than ever before, this really throws up some challenges. My two guests today uh, are Dawn Brown and Sandra Greaterex. In their own ways, provide services to help improve well-being in practical ways, either through pet ownership and coaching to help with employability. My first guest is Dawn Brown, owner of Rose Cottage Doggy Daycare. She offers five-star dog facilities for daycare and boarding, set in over five beautiful acres of secure land in Chesterfield. She's also a passionate furniture restorer and recycler. My second guest is Sandra Greaterex, business owner of a coaching and consultancy business, Butterfly Transformation, based in South Yorkshire, that helps individuals who've been made redundant or have been long-term unemployed to get back into work. Her big passion is employability. So welcome, ladies, to Hi, my Ellie. podcast. Yeah, it's Hi, interesting. Ellie. Thanks for the invite. Oh, thank you very much. So um, today we're going to be talking about kind of on the surface, they're kind of disparate topics, really, but in a sense, they are kind of linked to well-being and um, focusing on certainly as we age, you know, these these things that we can do to kind of keep our well-being up. And certainly, do, you know, pet ownership is definitely one way, isn't it? So, my first question to you then, Dawn, is how can pets help with well-being, especially as we age? Well, for me, first and foremost, I think it's companionship, um, yeah. because as we age. Uh, the family flies the nest um, they're all busy with their own little lives so we're, we're then as we get older become more lonely on our own Definitely. and that's where a pet can, can really help out um, and it reduces stress and it has a positive effect on your health as well um, so it's beneficial all around However, sometimes as we get older, we're not as fit as we once was. Um, what are you looking at me for? <laughs> <laughs> so therefore, um, we need a little bit extra help yeah. with the daily tasks of having a dog. Yeah. Um, they, they, they really do make you go out for a walk, don't they? They do, yeah. yeah. And if you're still fit and able to do that, then that's all well and good. But if you're not, then, then we offer the service whereby we can offer the daycare. So we do all the hard work for you. And then we return the dog home and... They're absolutely tired out and just want the dinner and lots of cuddles. Um, I so know that for sure. I have to have a vested interest here because my, my <laughs> lovely little Bentley, who's a, still a cocker uh, spaniel puppy, he comes home from your place when we've used your services. He is whacked out. He literally just lolls on the couch. You're like, Bless <laughs> him. He's a little sweetheart. Yeah. But it, it is companionship for me. As you're getting older, you want that best friend by your side. Uh, somebody that's with you day in, day out. Knows when you're having a bad day. Knows when you need a cuddle. And a dog just fits that, that bill. They're loyal and they don't answer back. That's correct, <laughs> yes. As long as you feed them um, and walk them, they're quite happy. Um and there's 8.9 million dogs out there, so 24% of the UK have a dog, um, so that's quite interesting fact. And I think possibly with an ageing population, it's probably that figure's probably going to rise, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, I would yeah. imagine so, yeah. 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 And there's lots of different breeds of dogs, um, so there's the cockapoo, which is hypoallergenic, so that also helps with the health as well, because if, if an older person has got allergies and hasn't been able to have a dog um, yeah. because of that, the cockapoo is... Is hypoallergenic, See, so they can that. still have that. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, so yeah. What is it about their fur? Is it? It's just that it's it's just because the the crossbreed yeah. with the spaniel and the poodle yeah. is the the coat's different yeah. to what you would get on a, a regular dog. Right, right. Well, um, yeah, for some that's that that has stopped. It's them a being, massive. It has stopped pet ownership, hasn't it? It has, yeah. yeah. And that's why the cockapoo uh, cockapoo breed is so popular at the minute because it is hypoallergenic. Do you know what makes me laugh is that the, we have names for these now. They're like the designer dogs. <laughs> And in yeah, my day, they're called yeah. mongrels. <laughs> yeah, and if you talk to anybody that's uh, that's in the kennel club, they would strongly agree with that. However, uh, with the crossing of the breeds, sometimes it's a bad thing, but sometimes it's a good thing. And in the case of the cockapoo, yeah. it's a very good yeah, thing. Yeah, it strengthens the gene pool, doesn't it? Does, it does, yeah, 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 it yeah. does, yeah. yeah. So in your case... Um, your your lovely site. Just explain to the listeners what kind of th facilities you've got and uh, what the dogs get out of that space. Yeah, yeah well, we're based in Chesterfield. Yeah. Uh, we're setting five and a half acres of secure grass paddocks, of which we've converted into different things for the dogs um, to do. So, for example, we've got a chill-out lounge. We've got a TV room. When can I come? <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> we've got an agility field. I want to be a dog. I know, I know. <laughs> uh, we've got a field of freedom, so they can just have a really good blast around, get all that energy out uh, in a secure environment. Um, and we've got a splash pool on the way. So I know, I'm so interested in that. <laughs> that's Especially the with next this thing. With this alleged heat wave we're going to be having. Yeah, let's hope. Yeah. Fingers crossed. Yeah. It will not be long. <laughs> um, but yeah, some dogs love water. So I thought, right, we'll, we'll cater for everybody and we'll get a splash pool in, in place and then they'll be happy as Larry in that. My dog will not want to come home. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> You'll have to adopt him. <laughs> Alongside the daycare, obviously, yeah. Ali, you know that we also offer the boarding. Um, so if the older generation do want to go and see family and they stop with a the family, they've got a plan B for the best friend. And I've seen where my Bentley lays his head at night and I'm so impressed. Honestly, Thank I've stayed, I've stayed in bed you. and breakfasts that have not even been as clean. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> you do, well, you describe what, what, how you've decorated those. Our kennels, uh, they've all got lighting and thermostatic heating. They've all got air conditioning. And they've got TVs and yeah. sofas. Um, and they're all um, clean plastic yeah. um, that is clean and wipeable. And it's, and it's, it's colourful. Colourful, yeah. it's modern. It's a fresh look on kennels, which is what I wanted to do. However, what I pride myself in is that the, ken- the dogs aren't in the kennels in the day. Yeah. They're out using our facilities. So that by the time they are ready for bed, uh, they just get on the bed and sleep, yeah. basically. Yeah. Uh, they can still enjoy the TV or the radio, whichever they prefer. Yeah. Um, but because of the facilities that we've got, we get all that energy out of them. Yeah. Um, so the, the kennel side isn't scary. It's not like a prison camp like yeah. you do get on your, sounds fabulous. your regular sounds kennels. Amazing, yeah. um, because like you were saying, you, know, you, you have domesticated pets. They're not working breeds. That's right. They, my They're part ben- of our family. They, Bentley is definitely part of our family. And he's trained as well to make sure that he sleeps on every surface with a soft cushion under his little bot <laughs> uh, he's got three dog beds in his house in the house uh, and to suddenly go from an environment where he's used to laying his head on something nice and soft and fluffy to maybe laying on concrete yeah you can imagine yeah, it's it'd quite be like, scary he'd be thinking what have i done wrong that's right and i've worked in kennel since i was 13 so i've seen the good and yeah. the bad and the very ugly and i said when i do it for myself i'll do it totally different so which took, is what we've done yeah so you took um, all the bad points. All the bad points. Turn them around. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly and I, that. And I think that can only be a good thing. You know? We are a small team. We've only got a team of five. So we're not a corporate kennels. Yeah. Um, but because we're only small, we can offer that best book service and give every dog the love and care and attention that it needs. Yeah. And every dog's different and they've all got their own characters. So that really is um, a big scope. Yeah, and I suppose, you know, I, what I quite was impressed with was um you've got a, like a chill out area for when dogs are a bit you know they don't want to get friendly with anybody they just want to be left alone like humans they have off yeah, days don't yeah, they yeah that's right yeah uh, and, they, and they've still got a facility where they can be you know where their mental um stimulation can still take place and they can still get the fresh air and they can still do stuff and they can get their sniffs and smells um and, and they're, but they're just separated for, for safety for everybody. Yeah, that's right. It? Dogs are pack animals yeah. um, and they behave very much so when there's no owners and no dog leads about. They, they behave as pack animals. So as a pack leader, and you always get a pack leader within a pack of dogs, um, they'll always follow the leader. But some burn out very quickly. So it's important for us to recognise that and to take them out and put them into a chill-out lounge, yeah. which is what we've got. Yeah. Um, a lot of other kennels and daycares, they put them into crates. I don't believe in that. Yeah. I wouldn't put my child in a crate, yeah. so I'm not going to put my dog in it's a crate. It's just reinforcing, like they're, they've been naughty or something. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Whereas we don't want to do that. We want to just take them out and let them just calm, calm down, come back down to earth, yeah. and then reintroduce them into the pack once they're ready to be done. Yeah. yeah. So how do, you, how do you see Rose Cottage Doggy Daycare developing if you want to develop your services? Yeah, my, um, my long-term goal is to franchise my business um, so that we can revolutionise the way that kennels are run. Yeah. Uh, I'm very passionate about I do what I do. It's not a job, it's a lifestyle. And if somebody else wants to buy into that lifestyle, then I want to be able to offer them the knowledge and the service so that they can do that um, in the correct manner. So they get to know that all the knowledge of the breeds, what you can and can't mix, because obviously not every dog does get on. Um, so it's a constant... Um, operation it's not something you can just do overnight Uh, and then like I've said before every dog's different I think it's so lovely to find a service for our best friends you know that you can put your name to and recommend to other people thank you I I definitely have recommended your services to other friends of mine that have got dogs because I think 
it, it's literally like a home from home. I also want to do LA um, on our site because we've got five and a half acres. Um, I want to convert an old barn into a, a dog cafe so that the older generation <laughs> can come and have a cup of tea and we'll exercise the no. dog for them. Sorry, that, that, that's just in my head. I've got doggies <laughs> sitting around. <laughs> drinking coffee. Drinking coffee. We do have doggy beer, so if oh, they want I Prosecco know. or it's doggy like beer, they can have one. Is it Prosecco? Poor Prosecco, yeah. Yeah, yeah oh, we do have that. I think that's lovely, yeah. you know, because they have friendship cafes with seniors, don't they? And they I do, and, and there's a cat cafe in Chesterfield, Isn't and that's there? what gave me the idea yeah. um, to renovate the barn so that, especially the older generation yeah. that want that, that social interaction as well with yeah. other human beings yeah. while the pets are getting exercise would, for them. Would you ever think about people who don't have a pet but would like the opportunity of maybe stroking a pet or getting the benefit of the you know the the wellness from a pet? Yeah, a yeah, of course. Like yeah, I've not thought of that, but yeah, yeah good oh, idea. There you go. <laughs> Just give yeah. you a new yeah, business idea. Really yeah, nice, there we go. Yeah. yeah, you know, maybe offer a yeah. service whereby certain certain regular doggies with you know, owner's permission or dogs that you have yourself, you know, they can be kind of not lent out, but on the facility, the opportunity to mingle with people and be socialised and, and people can go and have a cup of coffee and a, a dog cuddle. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. it is very beneficial, um, the positive impact. And the and you can reduce stress by just cuddling a dog. It's as simple as that. I, 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 I've looked into that and it's um, it really affects the immune system in humans. Um, to literally hug something that's organic and living. Um, so unless you've got like your, your, your apple trees out in your garden, you, the next best thing that's organic and living is a pet, isn't it? It is, yeah. You know, and um, it literally can lower your heart rate. It can. It can thin your blood, you know, it can stop it getting clotty. Um, and mentally it just helps you switch off from life. Because I know if I've had a really tough day and I've walked in, my little pocket rocket comes back blasting out from the <laughs> kitchen oh, he, he he kind of said hello to you this morning didn't he, <laughs> he Sandra did. yeah and you were almost <laughs> bowled over you know and it's like be my friend be my friend be my friend um and you can't welcoming think, committee yeah you can't think of anything else when you've got a dog because and, they I, really and I always stand attention. by Ellie I always stand by trust your dog's gut instinct yeah. so if they don't like your guest yes. then don't yeah. have them back I had um <laughs> Uh, with our previous dog, and he was a cocker. Um, he was a bit grumpy because he was a rescue dog anyway. But there were definitely individuals who came into our home where he really didn't like them. Yeah, yeah. And on the surface, they seemed perfectly reasonable people. But to that dog, they either gave off a really bad smell or a scent bad vibe. or a bad vibe. Yeah, yeah they do pick up on it. certainly, when it, it was investigated, not very deeply, but investigated a little bit one person wasn't as nice as i thought they were yeah yeah you know and they were in my home and, your dog and i'm knew. like and my dog was like an early warning system and i'm like well well done there bud yeah can be very protective can't they oh pets? oh yeah, even my so bentley yeah. already you know uh, it, the garden and our front drive that's his territory yeah and uh nobody's cutting, going across that gravel without bentley and knowing i think about for it. the older generation <laughs> that's peace of mind Absolutely. that somebody else has got their back while their loved ones so, I mean, aren't there. We were talking about this smart technology is great and it's and it's growing, but nothing can beat the early warning system of a dog's ears, no. to be honest. It soon puts yeah. people off, though, doesn't it? It when does, dog's yeah. Barking. And especially if you've got that sign on your door, because you need to be protected these days. Yeah. Say, beware dog in on premises or something like that. You can buy these signs nice and easy. Trust me, I have a two-hour that barks <laughs> like a Rottweiler. Yeah, well, even <laughs> Bentley has got a quite a ferocious yeah. little bark. Yeah. Yeah. And he's like eye to a grasshopper isn't he you yeah. know he's not big at all but it's <clears throat> i think if somebody was casually kind of fencing your place then they're not gonna they're not types of breeds of dogs you think are good for sort of more senior people to look after um it depends on their personal situation yeah. so if they're still fit and able um and can get out walking daily mm. maybe twice a day um, then I would say go for a Labrador um, because they are one of the most loyalist breeds. Um, if they can't handle the size of a Labrador, if they're living in a smaller space, mm. uh, possibly a cockapoo. Yeah. Um, maybe an older cockapoo, though, maybe yeah. go and <laughs> try and rescue um, not, because not puppy, they are quite lively. Lad, yeah. yeah, they are quite lively in the early days. Um, I, had, I had like two black Labradors, though, and yeah. one of them was quite small. The female one, oh, she was she? small, well, yeah, yeah quite she's a dainty probably about one. as big as Bentley, Bentley really. Yeah. yeah. So you know, I suppose it depends on the size and character as well. Yeah. Depends what you yeah. want out of a dog. We've all got different characters. 
Yeah, some I would have thought for a, a more senior um, sort of sedentary person, you don't want sort of a needy dog. You need a no, dog that's kind chilled of chilled out. Chilled yeah. out. Wouldn't mind being cuddled, sitting on the lap occasionally. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't want something that's really independent and very boisterous, really, would you? No, no. no. Yeah. Or somebody that's going to bowl you over when you take it for a walk. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> break, I mean, my break a hip or something. That's yeah. not what you want. Even with my Bentley, I mean, he's just like walking muscle at the moment. Yeah. But I found by changing the lead type, um, I've got one now that actually I can put around my waist, and and my waist actually absorbs a lot of the shock. Because it's when he pulls suddenly. Your shoulders. My yeah. shoulder and my yeah. arm is always being wrenched out of its socket, you know. But by clipping it on my waist, it absorbs a lot of the shock and the energy. And he walks to heal a lot better. Yeah. You know, so I think it's the le- you know, it's the tools that you use as yeah, well. Yeah, definitely, definitely. You know, that's great. Yeah. Okay, that's lovely. Thank so you. Um, we'll come back to that. But my second question today to you, Sandra, is... Changing topic a little bit is how do we deal with long term unemployment and or the threat of redundancy, especially when we're slightly coming into our senior years or close to retirement? You know, how do we cope with all of that and feeling a little bit under threat? OK, um, well, I've been made redundant twice right. in my career. Um, the first time I was in my late 40s when I got made redundant, which was quite a shock. I wasn't yeah. prepared for that. So financially, you know, if you you sort of know, you can sort of like you prepare plan, yourself you know. and plan your finances yeah. and everything else. And how did they deliver that news? Because you hear some of these horror stories, don't you? Of people literally getting texts. Mm, yeah. 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 I mean, they did actually come in and talk to us, but I, I'd got an inkling that things weren't quite right because they paid me wage late uh, the month before. <laughs> so you start to th- get alarm bell, a little bit yeah. wary yeah. about things like that. So, you know, you sort of think, oh, and I'd already started applying for jobs at that point because I thought this isn't going well at all. Mm. Um, they're taking too many staff on too soon, they've grown too big, too yeah. fast. Yeah. Um, But I'd always been on short-term contracts. That's been my whole career, really. Um, Now, the second time I got made redundant, I'd already planned that I was going to set my business up. So I was working towards that because the first time I got made redundant, I decided I wanted my own business. So I'd I'd sort of been working through that. But, you know, sometimes it is about seeing it more as an opportunity and thinking about, okay, you're at... It depends on your circumstances. Yeah, you might need some money now, yeah, yeah. you know, which is fine. Um, but um, and you can just take any job just to alleviate that, which I did. I, w- I went to work on the checkouts in a supermarket because yeah, yeah. I thought I could, really need some money. Yeah, I've got to pay my bills. Yeah. You know, this is really urgent. And what I was going to get signing on wasn't going to pay my exactly. bills exactly at all. Yeah. But you were self motivated enough. But you changed yeah. your mindset. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And it is about staying positive, and that is so difficult sometimes to do that because you know you can't see the future you don't know what's going to happen and you, all the time you're applying for jobs you're waiting for that well it used to be i used to be waiting for a letter now it's waiting for an email yeah. or a phone yeah. call isn't it yeah. they don't send letters anymore so you know it's it's trying to remain positive so i i always say to people try to do some things because if you think back to when you were working you go you've got the money you haven't got the time and you go if i had the time i'd yeah. just do so and so <laughs> It's okay, so you've got the time now. So, so use now universe, your time. Now the universe has given you what yeah. you actually wanted. Yeah. 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 Use it constructively. Yeah. So, yeah. But I always saw when I got made redundant, the, my, my my new job was getting a job, applying for jobs. So I had all my desks set up. I, I'd, I'd look, I'd do a search. I'd have them all lined up with date order. I'd have a list and I'd be colour coding them whether, you know, when the closing dates were going to be. But it, you'd get up in the morning, like you say, and you approach this like a job. Yeah. So it would give you structure to your day and you'd feel positive that you were making a, you yeah. were doing well, your no best. Well, no action isn't positive, yeah. is it? Yeah. But people see, it's quite interesting, people see when you're not working as, um, you them pinching your time so you have to be extremely careful because they will um you know they'll go can you just babysit today oh, can I you just come and help me what, yeah. decorate like a time can drain you just yeah so so it's like you don't actually do the applying for the jobs because yeah. you you start doing things for other people and, and especially like, i suppose if you'd said no they'd go well, what else are you doing then yeah but you, yeah. you ain't got a job yeah. but no but i need to get a job mm. you know um, but I mean, it can be, you know, the opportunity can be about maybe retraining, yeah. refocusing 
of something else, something that you might have always wanted to do. You know, so actually looking at, you know, well, yeah, I've, I've always wanted to set my own business up, however, what would I need to do? What are the things that I need to do to put that in place? Mm-hmm. Or it might be, I've always fancied a job in doing something completely different. Then, you know, look yeah. for the training. I think that's right. It's offer. almost like you're kind of, you're at your midway point in life because we are living longer. Yeah. And it could also be a blessing in disguise. It's, it's, it's a very stressful time, I believe, but it's... Um, I mean, I've never been in that position where I've been made redundant. I've walked, <laughs> sayonara, <laughs> you know, I've like I've had enough of this one. Um, but I've never been pushed out, and yeah. I think that must be very different. I have family members who've been, in their eyes, pushed out, and they've like, all the hours I've done for them, I've done all this, and I've put my life on hold for them. I'm like, you are totally dispensable. This is business, yeah. you know, unless you own the means of business you are totally replaceable yeah Yeah. and i think some people you know redundancy is supposed to be the job to be made redundant and i have seen it in the past i have seen it where actually that isn't the case but i think you need to take the personal bit out of it because you otherwise you hang on to that and you end up in a ditch yeah and you, you can get right down, because I always say it's like a bit of a roller coaster, and it's how far you go down that dip, mm. how long it takes mm. you to come back up the other yeah. side. And if you go into a real negative place, you're not going to get yeah. a job very quickly. And the thing is, I think people, I think when once they're past their 40s, say mid-40s, there is a feeling that, oh my God, what am I going to get now? I'm never going to get a job in this industry again at my same salary. Yeah. Because people live to their salary, don't they? So even if you're on £60,000 a year, you've probably still got no more disposable income than somebody who's on 25 because you spend up to it, don't but you? But you see, the way I looked at it, I think I was getting something like £68 a week signing on. Yeah. And then I yeah. went and worked in the supermarket. I was earning a £1,000 a month. Yeah, exactly. You know, yeah. I, I could pay my bills. And yeah. I just think sometimes you, you have to go and do something, yeah. just anything, yeah, just to be yeah. able to have that, that money coming in, you yeah. know, because I, I couldn't pay my mortgage on yeah. £68 a week. And they yeah. weren't interested in that when I said that. They, were not, they didn't care that I hadn't got enough money to pay my mortgage no. and I could eventually become homeless. No, I know. So, you know, it's it, you've got to look after yourself. Mm. And I found the most stressful thing was signing on. Yeah. yeah the I've, pressure that yeah. they put you under, the job search, trying to throw me into positions that yeah. I said, if you read my CV, I am not qualified to do that yeah. and I have never done that kind of work. Yeah. And, you know... The, my daughter had a spell of that when she... First left university. I mean, she's landed on her feet now. She's got a fabulous job in the career that she wanted, etc. But that little transition straight from uni. And um, she signed on, which she was entitled to do. Um, And and she said she was made to feel like, what on earth are you signing on for? Because you're a graduate. You're bound to get a job. And she said... Well, I am working my art, you know, my bottom off basically to get there. Like you say, she'd get up every day, she'd have a plan, she'd be firing these things off. She was really trying hard. But in the interim, you know, okay, she hadn't got a mortgage to pay, but for her own self respect, she needed some money. And I thought, well, I'm not just going to pay her. She's entitled to sign on. Um, and she'd come home so dispirited and made to feel like she wasn't good enough. Mm. They really took knock the stuffing out yeah. of her mentally knocks your self-worth it definitely yeah, knocked her in. self-worth and it was only because of family myself and her nan actually that were saying look you've got some terrific skills already you've been working really in part-time jobs since you were 16 mm. because you know i was a single parent for many years while she was growing up and she had to be a lot more self-resourceful but it really stood her in good stead and i said don't give up keep going and we kept it cur- encouraging yeah. her and i said you're not going to be on the street. You're in a better position than some other younger people. You've got a roof over your head. I know you don't want to be back home with mum. I know it's annoying. <laughs> I know you feel like 12 again, but you're one of the lucky ones, actually. You have got a safety net. Yeah. 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 I mean, I did. I coached a guy. He, he'd been long-term unemployed. For 10 years he'd been unemployed. He'd suffered with depression and stuff in that during that time. And he was convinced that it was his age because he was um, probably in his late 50s. Yeah. He always kept saying, oh, it's my age. I'm not getting interviews. I'm not getting things. And, I, and I, I asked him how many jobs he'd actually applied for. And he'd applied for about 150, but not had one interview out of 150 applications. So 
And I, I tried to get him in to show me a CV because I said, there's something wrong with your CV yeah, because 150, 150 applications, you've not had one interview, there's something seriously wrong with that. Eventually, he gave in to me after I've probably nagged him for a while. It's <laughs> sort of like, you know, you need to let me have a look. And he did actually get a job interview. But then he went, it was a job that was what he used to do. It was in like hospitality. Right. And he didn't get the job, but it made him realise that actually he didn't want to go back into that. So it was quite an eye opener for him. And he actually was doing some voluntary work at the time, supporting um, sort of people with learning difficulties. And he got a job as a yeah. support worker, yeah. completely changed what he wanted to do because yeah. he realised that it wasn't yeah. that kind of thing he wanted to do anymore. Yeah, absolutely. It gives you a bit of a jolt, doesn't it? Yeah. But yeah. What are some of the tips that you could um, give to people who are, say, in their mid-40s, early 50s, who still want to carry on working and they haven't found their kind of their thing, their mojo about, you know, they've no idea what it is that they want to do with the rest of their life. So what what initial tips could yeah, you give them? I mean, I think sometimes, I mean, we all have to have some sort of purpose, don't mm. we? I think you've got to find what it is that you really like, what is your passion. And yeah. sometimes voluntary work is yeah. a thing to do. To go and, you know, if you think you might like working with animals. Yeah, you know, try before you buy. Yeah, yeah, go and do something with animals. And there's lots of things where they want dog walkers, RSPCA yeah. and things like that. So, you know, go and try different things. If you've not done admin work before, go and try doing some admin work for somebody. Yeah. And you, then you're getting the experience as well yeah. to make that change. And also, I think um, y- you, you just have to embrace new technology. Yeah. Because life moves on a pace. And it's no good saying, oh, but I've got all these years of work experience. But if they're not, if they're not utilising the new technologies, you're always going to be on the back foot. Yeah. Um, and I think it is tricky. It is difficult. But there are schemes out there and there are ways to be able to kind of at your own pace sort of start to gently kind of get used to some of these things. And I think that, you know, the older generation, we have that work ethic. Yeah. You know, that sometimes some of the younger, I'm not saying all the younger generation mm. are like that, no, but some not. of them yeah. haven't got that work ethic. You know, yeah. they don't s- work in the same kind of way as what the older generation do and they're quite willing, um, you know, to do things. So, you know, I, I think that you've got a lot of things going for you, the experience and everything else that you bring with you. But a lot of people can't see the transferable skills either. That's right. And, and that's also businesses can't as well. People, yeah. Business owners need educating as well. To sort of Don't just write off somebody just because of their age. You, you know, you have to talk to these people and say, you know, is this going to be a good fit for my business? Mm. Have I got a team of people that are really heavily, they're millennials and they're all firing and they're this, that and the other. But there's no weight to it. There's no depth of knowledge. Yeah. And there's no maybe interpersonal skills as well. Yeah, because life skills yeah. go a long way, don't mm. they? You know, I mean, I won't get my pension till I'm 67. Mm. You know, mm. so, you know, and that mm. may go up. Oh, it's you know, going it to. might be 70. Oh, it's going to be. So I, yeah. I, you know, you've got to envisage that some of these people can be working into yeah. the 70s. I mean, I feel very sorry for the, the women who are literally about to be retiring now and have literally been told, sorry, you've got another couple of years to wait. Yeah. I mean, it is hard cheese, but it is a two-edged sword. It's We've become victims of our own success in a way. We are. It's a good thing we're living longer, and they've just been caught in that kind of trap bet- betwixt and between. But in the long run, it'll work out for them. Yeah. Because I say, my daughter said, who's 27, she says, well, at least they're getting a pension. Because yeah. she knows yeah. she's not getting a bean. Yeah. No, really? Because yeah. the pension pot's going to be drying up in a decade. Yeah. Well, well nobody's like talking say, about people that. People are living they? longer, so, mm. you know, it's it's going to have some effect, isn't yeah. it, really? Yeah. And I think businesses need to kind of embrace this uh, kind of more mixed, balanced, you know, um, yeah. workforce. And also, you know, we're not going to all be trooping off into an office anymore, are we? We're going to have a lot more kind of remote working, yeah. flexible working. Yeah, and I saw a, a video on <coughs> LinkedIn um, yesterday about flexible working, you know, and I think it is about employers being a little bit more flexible. You know, there was a few issues on there. Mum with chil- young children, yeah. go taking them to school, picking them up. A woman that suffered with anxiety, didn't want to get on the tube because that, yeah. in rush hour, because that created the anxiety you know i have a friend who um she's uh early 50s and she got kind of nudged she said it was nudged she was nudged out when she hit menopause because she was taking quite a bit of time off she felt like rubbish 
Um, and she was constantly going to the doctors and having tests and bits and pieces, and she was really suffering from it. And her employer had absolutely no interest in supporting her whatsoever. And um, <coughs> she found out that she was being talked about in the office as the hot flush lady in a kind of disrespectful mm. way, actually. Um, and she held some key accounts and um, she just felt like the atmosphere changed after she'd taken quite a bit of time off. And um, younger members of the team who had no uh, concept of what she was going through, they were just like rolling their eyes, oh, she's having another hot flush, you know. And you just think, well, why didn't the employer just avail themselves of a little bit of training, a little mm. bit of understanding, and then got her to work around when she did feel better, maybe work longer hours when she felt better to kind of make up for when she didn't feel so good. Yeah. You know, because she'd be lo so much more loyal. You know, I think if you can be a bit more it's flexible. It's an educational yeah. thing, isn't it? And it's the same, like, with the men mental health thing, that people yeah. don't understand that either. Yeah. So that's another sort of, like, stigma that well, people get Well, I mean, I, worked in, I used to work in teaching, and I had a colleague in my English department, and she had well over a year off because of stress. Mm. And initially... You know, myself included, to my shame, I was very supportive and, it's, you know, because teaching is a very stressful profession. Um, but then it got to a point where everybody was picking up the slack and we're having to work harder ourselves because they weren't taking on mem extra members of staff. So you were doing work, uh, working longer, working harder hours. I was marking till midnight. And I'd think, oh, God, we, I wish I could be off with stress. Do you know what I mean? And I was starting to kind of... To resent it. To so resent yeah, it. Yeah. I was resenting it. Yeah, and I know yeah. my colleagues were as well. And then when she came back and then she was off again, it was all, oh, God. You know, I'm thinking, well, if it's going to affect you that much, love, you know, why don't you think about packing your job? And then I thought, and I caught myself and I thought, well, hang on. Hang on. We don't know all the circumstances. I don't know her backstory. And I fell into that trap of being quite dismissive about it. And I think as a population as a whole, we, we're, we're guilty of doing that, aren't yeah, we, really? Yeah. And, yeah. It, and it, you know, it's people's person's cir circumstances, isn't it? You know, things happen in other people's lives and oh they yeah. may not want to talk about it openly at work, yeah. but there's, it, we all can suffer with stress at some yeah. point. And I have. I've been off. I had four months off work yeah. with yeah. stress and anxiety. Yeah. I was in, like, denial at first that that's yeah. what was wrong with me. But you know, it's it's can happen to anybody. Absolutely, so, some things can just yeah. tip you over the edge. Yeah. And just I mean, I've suffered bouts of depression. You know, uh, you know, family tragedies, etc. Mm. You know, losing children, what have you. You know, these are big, big scary things that yeah. your body, your body kind of collapses. Your mind collapses sometimes. Yeah. You know, and some people are more resilient to yeah. that, don't they? They bounce back quicker. But then yeah. there's others that it, it affects them massively. I have him um, <coughs> sort of a different view on that, though. Because if people have been made redundant and say, for example, they do then want to go and work with pets and they want to become a dog walker, from a, from a person that owns an establishment that has to have insurance, abide by council legislation, all that sort of thing, the average dog walker doesn't have to have any sort of uh, licensing or anything. Yeah, that's true. So, they, so for example, if, if Sandra, tomorrow you decided, I'm packing up what I'm doing and I'm going to go out and walk dogs because it'll make me feel better and I'll enjoy it and all the rest of it, then good on you. But because there's more and more people doing that nowadays in the pet industry, it's penalising then the ones that run the boarding establishments and the daycare centres because DEFRA are bringing out more legislation to overcompensate the, the dog walkers. Mm -hmm. So, yes, I agree that people should do what they love for a living because I wouldn't think of doing anything else um, now I've worked with dogs. But do it the right way because it's penalising. And like you say, there's a little bit of resentment there because I resent Jill Bloggs starting up a dog walking round that can walk up to 20 dogs a day with no legislation, no insurance, no nothing. Whereas I can't have 20 dogs on site without having insurance yeah. up to my earballs, e eyeballs and, and legislation coming out my head. Do you know it what is, I mean? It's, it's, a bit, it's a bit like childminding, isn't it? It is, yeah, yeah. So I think it's very unfair that people yeah. just think, oh, I'll just start dog walking because it's it's going to get me fit and I'm, I'm going to feel better and all my anxiety and my stress and my depression and all that is going to go out winded. That's that, that's fair enough for that person, but they don't see the long-term effect on other establishments. Whereas if, say for example, somebody approached me and said, I want to work with dogs, da 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 I would definitely, 100%, say, right, come on then, let's, let's show you what it's all about and do it the right way. Yeah. Because there's, there's no legislation for dog walkers. There's no 
regulation. Yeah. Um, so it's like it's like if you um, if you child mind, there are rules and regulations now. Yeah, yeah, you can't yeah just, definitely. You can't just open your house up and just have kids hanging off the banisters. Yeah. Yeah. You know. and I think going into the pet industry mm. after all redundancy and everything, that's becoming more and more popular. Yeah. Um, but I mean, it may not. I mean, I just use do. dog walking as an example. But it might be, you know, they might want to train to be a veteran in this or yeah, yeah. working on the reception. In but if you don't like animals, there's no good going to work <laughs> well, on the reception a in a in a classic <laughs> in example. A, vets, is there? a classic example. I had um, an 18 year old approach me. She'd she'd suffered with depression and anxiety and all the rest. And it was a company called Dart that actually approached me. And they said, would you give her the opportunity to work with animals? She she really thinks and feels that that's what she'll she'll benefit from. So said, yeah, of course, no problem. So I put her through my training program, which took six weeks for me to install some knowledge and some basics into her. And she seemed to be all right. But then the mandatory jobs of picking up the poop, she wouldn't do. <laughs> and I'm sa- and I, so I said, right, well, well I think you need to go back job. to the drawing board <laughs> because that's that's first and foremost. Yeah, yeah. So she, was, she was too p- posh to pick up poo. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's like working with children. Yeah. You want to change the nappies into it. You know yeah. what I mean? It's, yeah. You don't like changing the nappies. There's no pretty point doing it. So, <laughs> so if you are in that situation, just seriously think about it because it cost me time and money that. Um, yeah. And it was really frustrating. I mean, uh, the reason I say voluntary work, because I've worked in the voluntary sector with a lot of charities and there are a lot of charities that require volunteers yeah they need to see, to see they them. need to see interest yeah. in that industry don't they so it yeah. might not be a business like yours yeah. but they may be helping a charity a good cause you know by doing by giving their time yeah. uh, but then they're you know also benefiting by finding something and it's helping them yeah. to eliminate the things that they don't like yeah. and the things that they actually do yeah. like yeah what's your view dawn on um like company dogs because there's a bit of a rise in offices, isn't there, of people um, having the company dog in in the offices to kind yeah. of alleviate stress amongst the workers. And yeah, I'm all up for that. Yeah. As long as the dog's health and well-being's yeah. first there, and foremost. Are there rules and regulations about that? Not at the moment, I don't think. So um, you can bring your pooch to work and put him in a. It was actually last Friday was the National Take Your Dog to Work Day. Was it? Yeah, I saw it was. That, yeah. yeah. People yeah. took the dogs. Didn't um, they? Because it is. It is known that if you even are in an office environment and you don't get to see the outside world if you b- do bring your pooch in that 10 minutes of cuddling again that yeah. positive impact on your mindset can put you in good stead for the rest of the day then it would my bentley would be no good but then <laughs> but then la there in la is a double-edged edged sword that one because then my daycare would suffer so it mm, would <laughs> gotta think about that one <laughs> well what you could do is maybe have some hire out dogs you yeah know, all, yeah yeah that's kosher, a good idea you yeah could hire them out for the day you yeah know? but i say my bentley would be hopeless he'd be it'd be so disruptive it'd be he'd like be, a tasmanian he devil he would he would he'd be upending all sorts of filing cabinets and he'd be chasing things down yeah. and you know he wouldn't be able to hear on the phone because he'd be like be my friend be my friend be my friend <laughs> keep know. jumping up they do yeah. have support dogs which is yeah. a similar sort of thing but they go into more um hospitals and that yeah. sort of thing which Again, for the positive impact yeah. it has on people's well-being. Yeah, you know. um, so definitely a good thing. Yeah, definitely. So getting back to um, this this feeling that people have when they get sort of late middle age. Um, I still consider myself middle age, but actually, I've gone well past that now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, no, I'm not that middle aged because my mother's in her eighties now, so I am well past that point now. Um, in terms of feeling that they st- can still contribute to society, you know, what what are your views about that? Everybody has something to offer, don't they? Yeah. And it, I think people have to find the purpose. It is about when you have a job, you have an identity, yeah. you have a sense of purpose, and you know, if you lose that, then it's then about finding that identity and that purpose in some other way. Yeah. You know, it's like when you're a mum, isn't it? Yeah. You, you're a mum to children. So if you don't work, you're a mum to children. So that's your identity at that time. Yeah, so and it's also like I it think changes we, we identify with our job roles as well, don't yeah, we? Yeah, you yeah. Know, we, a we job say, title. Yeah, you know. I'm a such and such and such and such, rather yeah. than, you know, I'm a, I'm a well-rounded human being and I can cope with most things. It's yeah. we, we, we kind of peg ourselves to certain job titles, don't yeah, we? Yeah, well, you, it's like kudos sometimes with people, yeah. isn't it? But yeah. they, they like that, you know, the job title that you've got, it gives, gives them some sense of importance yeah. in yeah. life. 
you know, and it, it depends. I mean, for me, as I got older, money became less important because with money, the jobs I was in was the stress. Yeah. So I didn't want the stress and my health was more important. Yeah. So again, it's about reassessing and getting the right balance for you in your life. Yeah. You know, it might be, I want to cut my hours down. I want to work part time. I don't want to give work up altogether because I can't afford to, but I don't yeah. really need to work full time. Right. You know, maybe I want to work less hours so I can see the grandkids a bit, a bit yeah. more often or a bit more of a help, you know, around the home or, or yeah. give back to my community. I found that, you know, I, I do a lot more community based projects now as well. And I give a lot more to charity than I used to. Yeah. And, um, because I feel quite blessed. I'm quite fortunate. I, you know, I have a, a lovely home, lovely lifestyle. And it's it's really about giving back now, you know, yeah. uh, to to my to my community as well, you know. Yeah. Okay. Well, if there's anything else you'd like to contribute to my lovely podcast today, it's been quite an interesting one today <laughs> because it's there is on on the face of it they're two different kind of topics, but there is a lot of intermingling there, yeah, isn't there? Yeah, there is. And, yeah. I, I, and we've identified maybe a new income stream for you, Dawn. Yeah, yeah. I'll yeah. take that one on board. <laughs> I mean, I, I always think for older people as well, it's, it's the social aspect, it walking is, the yeah. dogs, because the number of people that you speak to, yeah. say hello to you, that if you're on your own and it's, you're lonely. Oh, I've seen yeah, it. Definitely. It's, it's amazing. So this, is, this is a funny tale, actually. I went to see my daughter down in London a couple of months ago, and she took me to this sort of little cafe around the corner from where she worked, uh, and lived, sorry. And they were sitting in there, and it was full of women, right? And then this guy walked in, a middle-aged guy, with the most beautiful Weimar armor you've ever seen. I mean, silky, beautiful, piercing blue eyes. She was lovely, so well behaved. Every woman's eyes went woof, straight to that dog. Oh, yeah, yeah. Now, he was not being unkind. He was a very nondescript looking guy, right? But he, at, he got every woman's attention when he walked <laughs> in with that dog. The dog sat down. These these babes ah, came another up instru- to, yeah. I, could, I could rent a dog rent a dog <laughs> yeah <laughs> dating, a dating, dating dog <laughs> yeah dating I love it. dog <laughs> <laughs> and i tell you why because he had these women some of these women were younger women they were babes and they came up and they were talking to the dog then him and i thought under no other circumstances would that man attract that many women <laughs> There we go, guys. Get a cute puppy. <laughs> All the single men out there, get a cute dog. All the single men out there, get a puppy, a babe magnet. Yeah, don't get, don't, don't spend thousands of pounds on a Tesla car. Get a puppy. Yeah, way to a woman's heart. I right, it. I think we'll quit it on that, uh, on that, on that happy <laughs> note. Thank you very much, ladies. Thank, thank you, Ellen. Ellen. Yeah, thank and you. I'd love to have you back again and have a, a follow up on this. It would be really I'd love fun. to be back. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank, thank, you. thank you so much. <laughs>